welcome to The Mighty Dragon. Our guest today is actress Maria Austin. Maria currently stars as Mercy in the Apple TV film of the same name. We talk about this character and how Maria approaches acting, as well as her hopes and aspirations for future roles. She also discusses her pioneering production company, which champions women filmmakers. Welcome to The Mighty Dragon, Maria Austin. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. <laughs> oh, lovely. We're here to talk about uh, your feature film, Mercy. But first of all, I'd like to ask you, what drew you to acting as a career? Oh, um, I think as a child, I was one of those really irritating kids that I used to kind of love to watch and impersonate people a lot. Ah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, my mum's family um, are Northern Irish. So I'd hear... Um, you know, accents, etc., particularly Northern Irish. Um, and it was one I kind of picked up on quite early. Um, and I always loved stories. I think my, um, particularly my dad used to read to me a lot and he would do, I had this book, Uncle the Elephant, which is a really old book, and he would do all the different voices of the characters. And I used to get totally lost in this story or world of what was going on. Um, and he used, if he was late at work, he'd ring me and read it down the phone. <laughs> he used to take the book to work with him and sit at his desk and read it with all the different voices. And I could lie there with the telephone in bed and still get lost in the story. So I think that was kind of implanted quite early on. Um, then my granny wanted to be an actress in the 1930s. Oh. I know. And she... Um, she actually made a little cameo with me on um, the lovely Gabby Roslin's BBC radio show the other week um, because she has always been my biggest supporter um, and she used to use her dinner money. They, Her dad was the Woolwich ferry driver down in London and they didn't have much, you know, well, any spare money. So she used to go without her dinner to pay for her acting classes. Oh, and my gosh. Across London. I know um in like through through the war etc um so um she was a real like inspiration again from kind of very early on um and then I was kind of in love with particularly historical things Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility right. still one of the loves of my life I used to do a lot of pretending to be Marianne and I had various Marianne outfits I took it quite seriously and like I've got a photo of me when I'm about seven and there's a bit where Kate Winslet is ill in bed. <laughs> it gets the fever. They used to like to act out that bit um, quite a lot. Um, so I used to kind of choose like little scenes in the films and like to act them out. Um, right. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of that sort of thing. My brother... Um, was also my my mum and dad are, are wonderful and always really encouraged us to with like you know imaginative playing and dressing up etc so we were always just in and out of dress the dressing up box and being different characters he used to dress up as Anne Robinson on the weakest link and that is my <laughs> thing that I will lord over him for the rest of his life and it was what a claim to fame. Fame. Victoria, I will find you a photo of my brother dressed as Anne Robinson at about age like six. <laughs> um, yes. Anyway, so there was a, there was always a lot of you know playing going on in our in our house, I think, and um, playing different characters, and um, that was always really encouraged by different generations. So I think that kind of sparked the acting very early on. Wow. Ooh, so we know you as Mercy in the feature mm. film of the same name, available now <laughs> to buy or rent on Apple TV. Um, mm. What can you tell me about your character? Um, so Mercy is a factory farmed pig um, and we follow her journey through from factory farm to slaughterhouse um, and she narrates quite a bit of the journey um, yeah. as well as she goes through um, and encounters different people along her way. Um, so we meet the wonderful Mark Wingett, who plays the slaughterman. So he and Mercy have this kind of ongoing pursuit, I suppose, that runs for quite um uh is a thread that runs through through the film. 
um and his um the other workers etc and then you've got brilliant Annette Badland um who I just I mean I admire everybody so much it was such a, a joy to work on um and uh, but she plays the the judge um in it as well and um Wendy Morgan um brilliant actress she's she plays um one of the roles but she wrote it in a way that with a lot of empathy so yeah. um and it was for me um because the film is exploring you know some really huge subjects like um climate change and I suppose broadly animal rights and yeah economics. and like they're they're huge um topics which I don't know I I would always have been like they're important but almost kind of impenetrable like I'm not I feel like they can seem quite overwhelming and so um processing them in a way that is sort of um tangible and accessible is quite hard um and I think also a lot of them are really divisive um subject matters and people are are sort of uh, when we hear conversation, it's sort of one end or the other of the spectrum, and 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 there isn't a lot of room for conversa- conversation. It seems it's sort of quite um almost hard and fast, <laughs> like yeah, one end, one end or the other. And so yeah. I really thought um it was beautifully written and really cleverly told how Wendy had done it because every character is told with a lot of empathy, um. Yeah. And she'd done so much research into it and had a lot of um, support from different um, animal charities, et cetera, who had provided um, CCTV footage from inside the slaughterhouses. But she'd also, um, uh, there was a really central court case that happened um, about a particular incident. Um, And so the slaughterman and his workers, um, they were very, very, um, I believe, closely kind of, um, influenced by what was said during the the trial etc and like the impact of that sort of farming on their mental health and their experiences um so I think it is a film I hope that somehow breaks down those big topics puts faces on each sort of experience and angle within the the conversation um, without going, you should believe this, you should not do that. Um, it sort of lays everything out there and immerse you experience being one of those voices and then lets the audience uh, explore that for themselves. Yes. Can you share any memorable behind the scenes moments from Mercy? <laughs> yes. Um, so Mark Wingett, who plays the slaughterman and I had quite a lot of scenes, well, a lot of scenes together, particularly ones where there is um, a conflict, a pursuit, let's just say. I didn't want to ruin it for anybody. Yeah. Um, but he is really quite threatening towards Mercy in the film. He is, however, the loveliest, <laughs> like, cuddliest human uh He'll probably hate me for, the, for saying that, but incredibly warm, generous human um, in real life. And it was a it was such a, a joy to um, to do those scenes with him. And I and I think one thing that really I was really in hindsight, actually really grateful for, because um, like as, as a young actor, I think you, um, you know, whatever you experience on set as you're starting out and then, you know, building your experience is your kind of normal so I feel really really lucky that I was working with really experienced actors like Wendy included like at the helm of the ship and um, kind of from the off there um I I was able to be a bit of a sponge and um you know talk to them about their um careers and approaches there was a lot of very nerdy actor chat going on for me I was probably very irritating and um, <laughs> um you were saying about a memorable moment because we were shooting on um on a farm um and in, we were in a uh, big like barns um for a lot of it i am really really scared for agents oh yes i feel you on that <laughs> like 
bugs don't bother me at all. Right. Like I, I, I never be snakes so much. Rodents, like I don't, I don't want to do anything to them. I think they're kind of cute from a distance, but they, they, they're, they, they upset me. Yes. Um, so. There was quite a bit of when we, when I was shooting with Mark where, um, as I say, because we're shooting this pursuit, so we'd be running into shot or I'd be running into shot with him following. So we'd be going out of, um, you know, the ca- the camera would be set up um, so we knew, like, where we were in and out of, of the visual that they were doing. So we'd have to go and go just outside and then run in because... Um, Ge- geographically I suppose that we're covering the characters are covering quite a lot of space so there was it was being edited Wendy knew how it was edited together in terms of that journey through the space um anyway so there was quite a bit of me like crouched but just out of shot going oh, oh, is there a mouse is there a mouse is there a mouse oh. And Mark very, very patiently. At one point, he got he had there was a broom, and he because I as Mercy end up kind of crawling around on my knees in quite a bit. So in my defense, I my face was closest to the ground of the two of us. He's quite a tall human, and more than going to be his face wasn't going to be anywhere near any mice. But he very sweetly like <laughs> swept the floor and um, for me like where we where we were waiting. Um, yeah so that was um that was quite an int- uh, like and it just became a running theme like every time before we'd go into our like you know our more serious like roles just before we went on at all we'd be like okay cool um because the other thing is with the those sort of pursuit sequences um I suppose the stakes change slightly like throughout them so there would be points where we're closer together like or more out of breath you know wherever yeah we- with that so we'd have to kind of establish that between us and with Wendy before we were shooting and Martin who was our fight director um but just before that we would have to do like a little mouth check and then I'd be like okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, generally how do you prepare for a new character and immerse yourself in that role so I think um first of all I would tend to um like on a very basic level, go through the script and kind of um, see what I say about my own character and also what other people say about the character, because I think that gives a really good sense of, you know, that they're, well, either how they want to uh, portray themselves and what other people's perceptions of them are and why that is. And then you know, a lot of the time it's it's all subjective. So, um, but it's a really useful point, um, start point, I think. Um, so yes. I tend to kind of start there and then have a conversation with the director. I've been really lucky in that the directors I've worked with so far have been really open and collaborative and equally as nerdy with their researchers as I like. <laughs> and um, so then I would have a chat at that point and just... Um, sort of pull out any initial thoughts I suppose um, about the direction on a very basic level or that um, I think the character might be going um, I also feel like the the director is like um, the magic maker you know they have the bird's eye view of the whole film and so there will be I'm sure like some themes or elements that are going to be more prominent perhaps within the character that they're aware of for the purposes of the plot that might have an issue kind of struck me so uh, hopefully at that point those sort of things might kind of get added into the melting pot um and then I tend to go away and do a load of yeah reading watching talking to people um so if there's any uh like you know given circumstances like a historical period or geography yeah. where they are or um particularly accents um I work with a really lovely accent coach shout out to Matt Grady <laughs> um I I whether I'm prepping that would be for an audition as well yeah so it kind of um I feel like it's like layers of the onion I feel like you start off with this sort of impenetrable 
onion blob and you're like yes. what's made of and then as you kind of um I've, I have more insight as I as I go along and sort of try and understand more and more again if they are um perhaps addicted to anything again like when um I was working on um a proof of concept for a feature with uh, Priyanka Burford. So she and I have a production company, uh, new, our new baby, uh, Dawn Chorus Films. But when Pri is an amazing, the experienced actor and an incredible director, Ada Lovelace, who I was playing the scientist, she's on laudanum. She has uterine cancer, so she's in pain. Right. So we kind of developed this like scale, I suppose, of like, when did she last have her drug hit and how much pain is she in? So in this, like, so then you have a kind of shorthand, you know? Um, so going into the scene, they might, pre might be like, okay, she's a number like, the, the Lord of is wearing off. So she's at a number eight pain and number two high. But then in mm. this next scene, she's just seen her have some Lord of So she's like happy as Larry and not wow. in a, you know, yeah. except, um, Music, I think, is another one. I tend to make a little playlist of things that I think the character either would have listened to um, or pull, um, pulls out particular parts of the character to me. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, what challenges have you faced in your acting career and how did you overcome them? I think it's just, um, you know, with any work that is freelance it's the uncertainty of it and right um you know rejection um although I don't like I the, the longer I go on the more you know rejection you don't become de like desensitized to it but I think when I first started I take it really personally of like I didn't get that job therefore I must have done a really bad job oh, <laughs> you right. know rejection. And then I've been um, really lucky in that um, I'm really curious to learn about, you know, um, the different uh, elements that the team are all working on. And I have a couple of friends who are directors who have had me in to read on auditions. So um, I've not been auditioning for the show, um, but they've needed someone to read with the actors that they're seeing okay. at a really cool stage, you know. That was a real eye opener because the conversation when each actor left the room was not that at all. You know, it was really, um, oh, well, he was really interesting. We feel like he brings more of that kind of color of the character, but we do we want to go that way with it? Or, you know, it was it was much more like shades of the character. There, it, there was no reflection at all or even mention of like, good or bad act you know yes and yes that was a real like reassuring thing to me and I think you know I the my job is to audition and do my prep as best I can and yeah. um, try and build relationships um working relationships with different casting teams and directors and those brilliant people who are are um you know putting putting people together and just yeah being part of that kind of melting pot and there's something really reassuringly uniting I think about that is that you know my mum's always like what's for you won't go by you and I do really right believe that so I think when things get tricky or I've you know, being really close to something and um, it's not gone my way. I will, of, of course, I will like wallow for a, a, like a day or so. And then I always think of that, what's for you won't go by you, what's for, for you, what's for you won't go by you. Move on to the next thing. Yes, my auntie has always said that to me as well. That's some very good advice. <laughs> Are there any dream roles or projects that you aspire to be part of in the future? Uh, yes. Yeah. I would love to do some more comedy. Um, I think that really appealed to, I was going to say child me, it appeals to me now. Um, yeah. There's something really like joyous and connecting about making people laugh and laughing yourself. I just, I, it's 
really, really fun to be filming, preparing, etc. Um, I just, yeah, I love that a lot. Um, my other I, area, I suppose, is I'm a bit of a history nerd. So anything kind of historical, I really, really enjoy <laughs> researching like the time period. And it's kind of a bit of an excuse really to learn about a particular time period or place at that time. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoy that kind of rabbit hole. Um, so I guess in an ideal world, something like comedic, but historical, like the Serpent Queen, or perhaps Bridgerton, you know, those sort of yes. slight, slightly quirkier historical pieces would be my, yeah, like, dream space. Wow. <laughs> Just how do you balance staying true to a character versus bringing in your own unique interpretation to that role? I think that when I first look at a character, well, I suppose... When you've been cast as a character, you've been cast because there is something that the director or the team have seen in you uh, vibe, feel-wise, that aligns yeah. with what they want to explore in the character. Right. Um, and I think, you know, everyone's got a sort of, their sort of fundamental themness. <laughs> and that's not going to go anywhere, you know, whatever whatever character you're playing. Um, so I think it's a matter of trusting that the you'll you'll get the steering as you go through the process from the from the director about what and, and the other actors as as well are um collaborating with them will steer the direction you go with the character to serve the the film overall um but I think just trusting that there will be I think some I definitely feel like there are some characters I've played that have ended up being closer to me and I think quite often that's down to the writing and the 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 way that the dialogue's written sometimes you just find a character that is um you know their their sentences sort of quite closely align with how you would speak or or that sort of thing. Um, you've mentioned uh, you've set up your own production company. Can you tell me more about the ambitions of your company? Ooh. Yeah. Um, so it's Priyanka Bethard and I um, have set up Dawn Chorus Film um, because we are particularly interested in centering more women's stories and particularly women of different ages. All right. Um, there is kind of, we, we've both talked together a lot about how fundamental those kind of intergenerational relationships between women are in our own lives and the lives of all the women in our lives, um, et cetera. And making space to explore those on screen, I think is something that I think, when I think about what I want my very hypothetical daughter or granddaughters to see it would be a celebration of all the people in their lives but particularly um showing them very early on like the strength and empowerment of relationships with other women and right. I think I think perhaps you know over over the years there's there has been this sort of sense perhaps um, I'm going back to kind of, you know, older Hollywood, but that women are kind of pitted against each other and um, you play the, the, you know, there is the sort of beautiful girlfriend and the sort of quirky girl next door and then there's the mother, you know, it, it yeah. the, the women are in relation with the male characters rather than centering the relationships between the women. And I think that is something that Pri and I are really interested um, in exploring. Um, and also um, the other thing that we're um, doing is we want to create a set where everybody is welcome. 
and that we can facilitate particularly working parents, working mothers. Um, and I think there is such, it's a it's a strange one, I think, particularly and actors as well, but particularly on the crew side, I feel like talking to friends who are working in production, that women become you know, more senior in their careers, I guess this goes for any career, but um, also at the point where they might be having children. Right. So like on Monster Heart, our um, brilliant DOP, Sarah Cunningham, um, she um, was breastfeeding. And so she was pumping in between shots. And it just was, it. she is exceptionally talented and there's no reason why she can't do both. And it, took, right. it added... No, no issue or drama or anything to production. All it meant is that we um, would cut and somebody quite frequently, me, would be like, pump. <laughs> <laughs> Carol would get lifted off her shoulder and one of her um, t- camera team would just hand her, her breast pump. <laughs> she <pumped laughs> it, continue the conversation with Pri about what the next shot was going to be. You know, and 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 it was yeah. absolutely no skin of anybody's nose. It meant her lovely baby got fed. It meant she could do her job and do an excellent job at doing it. And yeah, it was just such a. It felt like such a no brainer. So I think that is something like we're really. Uh, you, you know, there may be sets where it's it's not relevant just in terms of our team, but if we can create a working environment that parents thrive in and is welcoming then the more the better I think um and yeah. we're trying to um because at the moment the last study I saw the the production um crew split was 70% men to 30% women on set so we're oh. trying to head so we're attempting to have 70% women 30% men on all of our sets right that sounds brilliant. Best of luck with Thank all you. of that. Sounds wonderful. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring actors entering the industry? Uh, welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, I would say, um, you know, it's it's not an easy job in terms of the uncertainty. I definitely um, feel sometimes I. I have a lot of friends that don't work in our industry and I have to um, remind myself that nobody's life looks the same and everyone's, you know, milestones are different and it's not a linear career. I think that is something I wish I'd known really early on is where where my friends in other professions um, were sort of moving up the ranks. I suppose this is particularly maybe like through the first sort of 10 years of your of my our career um and they're make their their sort of careers are progressing in a more linear way and they're getting promotions and pay rises etc um that doesn't mean that you are not doing well as an actor or as somebody in a more like creative industry because our careers just don't look like that they're not structured um yes. like that um so I think um find your tribe as well um there will be people that you meet along the way whether you know through readings or jobs or friends of friends etc um who are interested creatively in telling stories that appeal to you too or themes and celebrate each other be good allies tape together that is a really um I found really really important element for me I have a few uh, well two or three actor friends uh particularly my friend Ellie Ellie Van Yenke, who is amazing everybody should hire her <laughs> um, <laughs> we tape a lot together we know each other's bad habits etc and uh we will hold each other accountable and kind of direct each other and we've now developed uh, a language between us where almost like a shorthand so like she was doing um 
a tape and you know if we or, or I'll be doing a tape and if we get a couple of lines in and um, one of us is like no nope, go again th- like we have an absolute like trust between us that we're working towards getting the best like performance out of each other um, right. and we'll have some conversation about the character and um you know the stakes of what's going on and situation beforehand and like perhaps contrasting versions that uh, we want to get to send uh, our agents or the casting directors. That in itself, I feel like is so much part of the job and I get a lot of joy um, and it's very good for kind of keeping match fit, you know, in in terms of dissecting tapes and working with other actors on theirs. Yeah. And, and celebrate each other's wins. Like every time Ellie gets a job, it's, so exciting you know anytime any friends get a job it's so exciting and then they'll celebrate with you in return and I keep thinking you know everyone's careers progress at different rates but it's I visualize sometimes like all of my friends every time they get a job there or a job that I would love to work on or aspire to work on and somebody um said a while ago like imagine those people who inspire you are stood at a bar with a glass of champagne waiting for you so when you get your one they're all there all of those people who you um aspire to work with and they're waiting for you at the bar with your drink in hand and your wow. that's super powerful vision I am gonna take that for myself <laughs> <laughs> um last question um mm. what are your plans for the rest of 2024 TBC um so I'm doing a play <laughs> in um March oh we start rehearsals soon um for that called Agatha um it's a brilliant piece of new writing uh it's won a lot of awards uh playwriting awards in America um and here as well um and it is set in Rwanda in the 1990s and explores um the story of Agatha who was um a member of the parliament there and she became president for 14 hours between the assassination of the previous president and her own assassination 14 hours later. So the play follows that 14 yeah. hours. Um, so that will be me for uh, for a little while. Um, yeah. I'm hoping to, I spent my time between London and Belfast. And um, mm-hmm. so I'm going to get back over to um, Northern Ireland. Um, and there's a couple of projects in the pipeline there that I'm hoping come into fruition but to TBC and auditioning um, yes more and more auditioning um so that's my plan wonderful Maria Austin thank you so much for coming on to the Mighty Dragon all the best with all of your projects your production company and have a fantastic time in Belfast one of my favorite places (laughs) thank you so much come and have a coffee (laughs) absolutely Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Thank you. you.